Okay, welcome to COP1002. And we're going to head over to Blackboard. Cool. Let me just pull up a slideshow in Dropbox. Okay, so let's head over to learning modules. Today we're going to be uh, heading up module 10, layout with styles. So I think this will be a kind of an interesting kind of diversion from some of the work we've been doing um, in the sense that we're going to see some of the practical ways that uh, CSS can be, uh, can be used to manipulate content on the page in a very tangible way. So this is, we use, as, as always, I talk about, we use metaphors, right? So to, to help us understand, like, you know, things like a directory, you use a folder to, as a, to help us understand what a, uh, what a directory's function is. So we're going to investigate something today called the CSS box model and why that's important and critical to your understanding of rendering any UI or user interface components um, using web front end. Right? So um, we'll, we'll understand how this applies to your elements and to the document object model and how you can use these tools um, to effectively begin the basically the, the underpinnings for layout. Um, so we'll look at the parts, uh, how we position these, how we float them, how we clear them, um, so how to some degree also it doesn't matter what order your content is in your markup, your HTML, the CSS, you have the power to place that anywhere you wish on the screen. So this gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility with the presentation layer. So this will really give you uh, an appreciation for uh, separating, the reasons for separating the, the data, the content from the presentation layer, what it, what it looks like. Um, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll follow along. Um, uh, first of all, we'll lead up first of all with a demonstration of a uh, description of the box model uh, with a PowerPoint and a, and a physical demonstration. We'll get into the uh, uh, a walkthrough of how to manipulate these various parts. You can see this on the screen. Um, and uh, I'll pass you off to a lab, to lab 10. And, uh, and then you'll be uh, sent home with uh, chapter 11, required reading, and quiz. Quiz 10, layout with stops. Okay, and that'll be this week's work, if you will. Um, there's also an optional reading um, uh, here. Um, so this isn't required, but I think um, uh, given some of the um, some of the developments now in in uh, in CSS powered layout, it's important that you understand 
uh, the difference between content box and border box with box sizing. So I, I'll go through this so, so we'll get appreciation, but this is a, a relatively short article from MDN, and it really is worth your time. You can see it's not a, it's not a, a heavy read. So consider uh, leafing through that as well. Cool. All right, so uh, let's power this down here. Um, oh, we'll also, um, we'll also show you how to extract um, from, uh, from Microsoft Azure, how to extract uh, FTP connection credentials and move files up to the server. Okay, so we'll give you another, another way uh, beyond just, uh, uh, or, or as opposed to using uh, uh, some sort of versioning, version control system like Git to move files up, we can also use uh, plain old FTP. So you'll have, it's a skill you'll have to, it's kind of a little older technology, but it's something you'll have to have in your back pocket. And uh, it's always there. So um, let's head over first of all. And we'll take a look at the CSS box model. Cool. So what, what do we mean by the box model? Um, first of all, the, the model, again, it's just a metaphor. It's just a way of kind of understanding these rel relatively intangible things um, in a very kind of, and, and illustrating them in a, in a mental construct that is, that is more, um, uh, you can kind of wrap your head around. So um, there are uh, a number of different pieces to the box. So first of all, I'll use, I like to use physical logic because it really helps to, uh, I think, kind of make things a little bit more real for people. So the first thing, the first component of uh, the CSS box model, and, and the box model is, is kind of um, any element you place on the screen, whether that's a paragraph, whether that's an emphasis element, whether that's a, uh, a div, whether that's a, an H, H3, doesn't matter. Any one of these elements consists of any and all of these components, okay? And so um, we'll look right now just to, we'll just imagine a generic component, maybe a paragraph with uh, some text inside it. So the, the paragraph, the content is the first box. So you can imagine, um, and irrespective of what language this is, like it could be a, a language that reads right to left, it could be left to right, it could be top to bottom, it doesn't matter, right? It could be any, any language. But generally, you can describe a, a language. The glyphs in a language are going to be rows and columns, or columns and rows, and you're, they can be described roughly with a box, with a square. Okay. So this is called the content piece of the box model. Around, behind, and surrounding, or containing, encapsulating the content is something called the padding. So I threw that in there. I got it. Okay, so the padding, um, notice you can also see it behind the glyphs here, whatever characters those might be. This is, of course, US English, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so the padding um, represents the space behind and around. These, and these areas around the content box, you can set them together or that, that amount of space together or independently of one another. Okay, you can also set a background color on the padding. So when you set a background color on an element, you are actually colorizing or painting the padding part of the box. And that's important to understand. Um, so if you can, because um, sometimes the, the CSS properties, they're not, they're not very descriptive, right? Uh, so yeah, and, and also you can, if you wish, in addition to this, you can place a background image on any element you want on the page that will render in the padding zone of the box. Right? So behind the text, which is called the, which is the foreground color. So when we set the color of an element, we're actually setting the font color. Like I talked about last week, you're, you're not setting the color of this. This is background color. You're setting the color of an element. You're setting the element's a, generally a text element. So you're setting the color of the text in the content box, not the background color. Okay? So that's padding. Around and uh, on all sides, of the padding, we have another box called border. Okay, and the border um, it can be uh, in this case we have solid a solid line. It can be represented by a double line, a dotted line, a dashed line. Um, you can get that cheesy kind of 
90s faux 3D, if you really want to, you know, go retro. Um, you can do that. Um, so there's, it, this is, it's essentially a line, right, around, uh, which is, is uh, uh, traces around the padding. You can control the color, the style, and the size of each and every one of those borders independently or together with. So they can all be different if need be. So um, now, the, the last part, of course, is called the margin. Now the margin, I represented this with a kind of a blue box, but in a sense, this is it's kind of uh, deceiving because the margin can't actually be uh, colorized. It can't be. It can't be painted. It can't be styled. Um, it's simply empty space. So if you apply a margin, and you can apply the margin on all or one or more or two or three or independently around an element, it basically just forces empty space uh, between it and maybe prior or subsequent elements on the page, in the page flow, right? So a lot of people, you might see in some code, uh, someone put a series of break tags. You see break, 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 break. As soon as you see that, um, you realize, well, the person was trying to create space. But the problem with that is they're using HTML to generate line breaks, where all you need to do is just set a, a margin on an element and with a, you know, many, many characters less code, you can have very finely green control over how much space it, there is between things. So, the, so the, the margin can't, you can't really style it in any way, but you can certainly size it and it allows you to create empty space around elements. That's all cool, so the box model's cool. Uh, here's where it gets a bit weird. So first of all, let's talk about box sizing. So, and the CSS box sizing property is um, how we control the height and width of this element. And you may say, well, the height and width of this element is controlled by the amount of text. Well, that's true if the height and width are set to auto, which they are by default, right, for most elements. Um, uh, the height of most elements by default is set to automatic. So you type content in a left to right language and it breaks to a new line, it will add one line of height to the box. No problem. Um, most block level elements, which um, you have both inline block level and inline block, which I'll talk about uh, a little later today, um, are width 100%. So what that means is um, they'll take up the full width of their container. If that's the, the document window, they'll go 100% of the document window. If that's the browser window, they'll go 100% of the browser window. So unless you set that to uh, width auto, most elements will be width 100%. Now what do I mean by 100%? When I say 100% width or when I say 500 pixels in width or I say 200 pixels in height, what am I measuring in this box? So the default rendering mode, so if you don't set box sizing to anything, most browsers will be content box. And this is what this looks like. So let's just say I set the height of this box to 25 pixels. That means I'm setting this to 25 pixels. That's, that's a little bit um, unintuitive. Right? Particularly if you're, uh, you kind of come from a visual design background or a graphic design approach. Um, I mean, you're, you're like, I want the box to be 25 pixels, and that's what you get. So what happens is the, 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 the content box, if I were to say that's, well, in this case, then in order to find the true rendered height of the box, I would have to add now, not only that, 25 pixels, let's figure out maybe that's 30, and that's 30, so that's 60, and maybe that's 10. And 10, that's uh, so I mean, 80 plus 25, and so 105 pixels in height. But I said 25 pixels in height, right? So the, the, the content box model is additive. You have to add up all of the parts, right? And the mark, well, and the, the border, uh, the, border, the margin around the outside as well, although that doesn't, that doesn't appear. So with content box also, if you just, if you say, I want the element to be with auto, and this is what you'll get. It'll size to uh, the uh, content, and that's that, but to the content box. 
So if you have padding right or padding left, border right or border left, margin right, margin left, you have to add all that together. So in order to get the true computed height and width of the box, you have to do, do all this addition. That's called content box, right? And there was a, there was a dark day in history where um, the popular browsers disagreed on this. So one popular browser, I think, uh, was Netscape, for example, at that time. Um, I think they did it this way. And if I recall, Microsoft Explorer uh, did it the other way. So you basically had to write for your entire layout basically two pieces of CSS if you wanted to use CSS for layout. It was, it was crazy, right? So thankfully, we've, uh, we've all kind of agreed on this. So that's content box. Now, border box is a little different, and perhaps in some ways a bit more intuitive, but it's not the default setting for CSS. Okay? So border box is, say I say, I want this element to be 60 pixels in height. What that'll do is it will measure to the outer extreme of the border and figure out everything and cram everything else in between. So if I've got, you know, uh, 15 and 15, it fits it in here. It does whatever it needs to do to make sure this is 60 pixels in height. That doesn't include the margin. Okay, the margin is empty space around the box. So we talk about the box model or the box itself, really we're talking about to the outside of the border. Same thing with the width. So if I'm talking about border box and I set the width to 350 pixels, then that's going to set this width up here to the, to the extreme up the border. Same thing. Very weird, but that's what we got. So every element you have on the page, every element, has all of these moving parts. Okay? And you think about it, you think about your document. Whoa. You add up all of the start and end tags you got, all of those elements. You add it up. You realize how complex, really, a, a, a nested structure that is for the for the rendering engine to, to paint on the screen. All of this stuff is by and large invisible. It doesn't mean it's not rendered on the screen. The, the CSS engine actually goes and draws it all out, even though it draws it as fully transparent and with no color. So, um, so this is why it's important also to make sure that your HTML, your markup, is as simple as it possibly can be, but no simpler. Don't throw in extra elements just for fun, right? Or just because you feel like it. It's a bad idea. It, it adds extra overhead on um, uh, to the CSS rendering engine, to the browser, right? And more often than not now, we're not, we're not using a high-powered browser to render pages. We're using a mobile device, right? It's great. You go and, uh, you know, look at these current mobile phones. They're, they're browsing all these amazing processors. That's great. But it, they still don't hold a candle to this or what you've got in front of you on the, on the, on the table there, right? It's getting closer, but it takes also it takes a lot of energy. You know, how many of you uh, have a, a phone now that can last two days without a charge? All right. So... Anytime you make the page more complex, or you're 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 adding more uh, overhead to the page, to the CSS, to the browser, uh, the user agent, right? And and particularly as we get into more mobile, more battery powered devices that aren't plugged into, that means energy, that means power. So keep it simple, and uh, but not too simple, right? Simple enough. Cool. Let's see how this crazy thing. Let's X out of here. Let's see how this crazy thing actually works. Um, i trying to think, should we start with, uh, maybe we'll start with Azure. We'll start with Azure. So fire up a browser, I don't care which one. And point the browser to portal.azure.com. Okay. Now sign in with your personal Microsoft ID, not your student email address. That will not help. Okay. Remember when we set up Azure, there's two steps. There's the student email address, 
that you set up at imagine.microsoft.com and then with the portal we set it up. So mine for example is Scott <coughs> at Okay, so we're going to have you deploy a web server uh, just for this class. Okay, um, uh, so this server will uh, it, this will uh, do for any and all uh, work that you want to do uh, for fundamentals class. Um, I caution you against deploying a server every time you want to go and use Azure. You end up gobbling up a lot of resources at, at, on the database. You can say, well, it doesn't matter. I'm not paying for it, but it does add to the overhead of that that data center. And that takes energy, and that's uh, um, you know you have to be mindful. That once you get into a production environment, you start using uh, elastic resources like like cloud-based uh, provisioning. Um, you start going willy-nilly and just deploying stuff. You're going to get a bill for thousands of dollars at the end of the month. Oh, I didn't do this. Yeah, you did. <laughs> These things are really expensive. They can be really cheap, but if you if you don't keep your finger on the switch, you can burn through a lot of uh, cash using um, cloud-based resources. So. Let's go ahead and deploy. We'll go ahead and hit the new button over here. And we'll go and hit web app. We'll deploy a new web app here. Now, if you don't, if this, if all of these, if, if you don't see this or something isn't quite right, make sure up here, this says your personal Microsoft ID login. Not your if it's if you see your student email address at Georgian up there, log out immediately. No good. Won't help you. Azure will not function. Okay. Your uh, your subscription is associated with your personal Microsoft ID. So make sure your personal Microsoft ID is up here in the top when you log into portal.azure.com. Okay. We'll launch a web app. Um, so you can't deploy a web app with either one? No. no? Uh, we'll have to take a look at your specific account. So um, just just watch how we do it. We can do all we're going to do today locally. It doesn't really matter. But I want to start getting people used to different ways of connecting to this. So we'll show you the, yeah, it, it's it's not a big deal. But we will, we will want to fix that for you. Um, so the app name, this has to be unique on the Azure websites uh, .net um, top level domain. So you're, we're actually creating something called a subdomain, right, on AzureWebsites.net. So you have to enter something here that is unique. Um, so you can put your student number. Um, I don't know. Try a number of uh, combinations. I'll put comp one zero zero two s McCrindle, for example. Nope, that's I already took that. Huh. Um, and I'll put. Uh, S for Crindle dash fall 2017. Maybe that. Yeah, I'm good there. All right. So try and find a subdomain that is not taken. It'll you'll you'll see a little check mark here if you're good. Try to use something that's kind of it doesn't have to be too convoluted. Your subscription here should say probably imagine. Mine is from the old DreamSpark system, which is kind of the same thing. So uh, your subscription should say imagine. Um, a resource group is kind of a way of uh, um, uh, collecting different uh, applications. So if you're not sure, you most of the help thing. Collecting certain applications. Say you're in a large enterprise and they have a bunch of apps for a certain product that are related, or a, a certain department, like an accounting department. And these are all financial applications, and they have kind of similar kind of business logic and processes and timelines and life cycles and things like that. You group them under different resource groups. Um, I'll just use the existing one here. Uh, I've got a default or comp one zero zero two for you can group them by class if you for your classes if you want. That's up to you, whatever you want. The app service plan or location that tells you what um, uh, what uh, data center you are using. Um, 
in the so this we were in the south central US. I don't know why it defaults to that. I think it has something to do with where we connect to the internet uh, for our internet service provider at Georgian College. Um, I think we connect out west to the, the prim our primary connection to the internet. I can't, I, I can't remember exactly why we don't connect to the US Northeast, for example, but you can you can uh, you can do that. You can head out here and head over to uh, say um, Canada East, Canada Central. I don't know. Would we be closer to Canada Central? I guess so. Eh? Try that. Right. right? Uh, call it uh, Canada Central. And make sure your pricing tier is free. <laughs> don't, don't get into burning. We did have, uh, not to alarm you, but we did have someone who, when they signed up for Azure, put in their credit card. Did I tell you this? And he ended up with like a $600 bill at the end of the month. Yikes. Don't get into that, right? Um, app service plan. Why can I? It's an invalid character. Probably a space is an invalid character. So that's cool. So <clears throat> they're all. Uh, I'll use Central Canada, maybe decrease a bit of lag time. Um, also here, uh, pin, pin it to the dashboard. So that means when you log into the portal, that'll show up right away on your dashboard rather than hunting through, uh, leafing through all of your different uh, uh, deployments. And then go and hit Create. And if everything's cool, it'll chug away, take a while. You'll see it on the dashboard, it should say Deploying Web App. So what's happening is, um, on that data center, um, the uh, Azure is actually creating a virtual server for you, just, you know, um, and it's creating, spinning that up. It's going to be powered with a Windows-based operating system. Uh, I think it's IIS uh, or Windows Server, something like 2012 or something like that. A fairly recent edition of uh, an operating system that's that's optimized for serving uh, web apps, um, and then when everything kind of gets up and running, you'll see uh, you have an, you, you should head over to your overview page. So a couple of things that'll be helpful is it'll give you where it's running, uh, Canada Central, a subscription group, you should have uh, Imagine in there, um, and you'll have your URL, so the Uniform Resource Locator or address for where that application lives. Uh, the pricing plan, FTP deployment username, so that's when we're, if you're using file transfer protocol to move files up there, if that's the way you're doing it. Um, uh, the FTP has its own host name, uh, and uh, FTPS host name uh, for secure, and it is the operating system name is Windows Server 2012. So you have your own machine running Windows Server 2012 dedicated to your application. It's not real, it's kind of sort of imaginary, it's, you know, it's created, it's virtualized in a very large data center that can, that can press a very large array of, of servers. Right? So if you ever get the chance to go inside and look at a data center, they're very interesting, pretty cool. Um, uh, okay, so that's cool. So we take over here, you'll see the URL. There's a little click to copy. Click on that uh, little copy icon. It should say copy to your clipboard, so that copies that uh, your uh, URL to the clipboard open up a new tab and paste and go on that and if everything's cool you should see a um, a happy looking window there that says your app is up and running you're good to go okay. if you don't have that or if uh, something along the way here broke um, not to worry we'll connect with me and we'll make sure that we get your your Azure uh, service up and running Next part, we need to be able to uh, move files that we're developing locally up to the server. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to get something called your file transfer protocol uh, credentials. Now FTP is not, um, those, these files are not managed through a version control system, right? So uh, it's a, kind of like the, the most basic way of moving files from one server to another. Um, FTP, well, it can be useful in some respects. Um, nowadays, if you're working on a team of people, that code should be managed now using a version control system like Git. So, um, but there are there are times and there are times and places for just you know moving a file up here or uh, you know a, 
a text file, a config file, a piece of JSON up to another server. And sometimes you need FTP or FTPS, which is secure FTP, um, to move that up. So let's figure this out. So I want you to, there's a link up here called Get Publish Profile. Click on this. And it should download this, probably to your downloads setting. I don't know where that is here. I'll show this on my folder. Sure enough, that went to my downloads. That's cool. So you should have a, a, a page called whatever the uh, subdomain, whatever you called your app, dot publish settings. It's just a text file. Okay. We'll take a look at that in a code editor. So fire up a code editor. I've got Visual Studio Code. It doesn't matter. Use whatever brackets, Sublime, Visual Studio. I'm going to go uh, whole hog. That's cool. And we'll open this up. In my downloads and open up the whatever dot publish settings file. <clears throat> and of course, I'll zoom this up so you can see what the heck I'm doing. Okay, so uh, this is cool. It will be all of this data will be on one line, right? So it, you may need to. Uh, adapt your interface so you make use of word wrap and you'll see all this stuff now um, this file is actually in a uh, in a format called XML so they could just have easily called this uh, publish settings dot or comp 1000 whatever I called it dot XML um, so you'll see that these tags have a start tag and an end tag so I have a pair of publish profile or publish uh, I have a published data tag and then inside that published data tag, I have a published profile, <clears throat> I have one published profile, and then a second published profile. Can you see that? Get those tags out of there. So XML is, a, is something called extensible markup language. It's where you can basically create your own elements, right? Uh, as long as you adhere to the syntax rules of XML, where you open a tag, you must close it, attributes are quoted, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, you can kind of create your own, as it were, HTML, except not quite, it's, it's XML. Um, so that's cool. So our second published profile tags here, I'll just put these on a, on a separate line here just so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. This second set of published profile uh, data uh, is for the file transfer protocol for the FTP. Okay. Um, this one up here is for a proprietary connection uh, protocol called uh, MS Deploy. So say you're using um, uh, say you're using Visual Studio, uh, the full version of Visual Studio. You can you can take this .publish settings file, upload it into a project on Visual Studio, and it will it will parse this file and automatically connect you to an Azure web uh, an Azure app on the server, right? Which is kind of cool. So, um, but we're going to, uh, we're, we're just going to use the, we're going to show you the FTP method, right? So cool. So a couple of things in here. We need uh, a couple, three things in here. We need our, our username, or sorry, we need the publish URL. We need this. Okay, that is the server to which we are going to be publishing these files or connecting to. So you'll see that that is the value for publish URL. The second thing we'll need is our username. And the attribute is called username, strangely enough. And the final thing of three that we need is our user password. That long string there. Okay. Relatively secure. Okay, so those are the three things we'll need. So what we're going to do is we're going to punch these credentials into an FTP application. And this is an old application called FileZilla. I'll see if I do I have this installed locally. I doubt it. FileZilla. No, I don't. Grr. All right. Yeah, so we say uh, put FileZilla. If you don't already have it, is it? Does anyone have this? Uh, hands up if you've got this already installed on your machine. All right, so if, if you don't, uh, head over to punch in FileZilla. 
Um, and be careful here. You want to go to the FileZilla project.org. Don't go to, directly to SourceForge. You might click on a on a, a, a bad link and end up with a bunch of adware. It's not cool. Um, there's two options when you're downloading FileZilla. Do not download the FileZilla server. That won't help you. That, that module goes on a server. You, you are offline. So you want to download the FileZilla client. Right? So be careful. If you download the server, you'll be hopelessly confused. Uh, it won't look anything like what I'm going to show you. So pull that down. Um, it should uh, it should detect your operating system. <coughs> All right, hit download. I think this is going to will this send me or will this? Yeah, there you go. That'll bring me that'll give me the exe. So hopefully you don't. If you head over to SourceForge, uh, try and make your way back. Try and make your way back to FileZilla uh, project.org if you can. Okay, there's, um, I've had instances where people have downloaded kind of a different version of FileZilla that has all kind of adware bundled to it that's not cool. So pull down that. I will, let me see. So let's launch FileZilla here. OK, cool. So once FileZilla is up here, we'll go to the file. Uh, we'll go to um, Site Manager. So we'll punch this in so that you can use this setting. You can come back and use it. You won't have to do all this setup again next time. So if you want to use FTP as a, a method of moving your files up and down to the server, that's cool. We'll go and click on New Site right here. A new site definition. And you'll have a couple of tabs over here. Uh, or first in this panel here, give your site a new name. So this is my COP1002 uh, site. You hit enter there. I don't know, you might have may have ultimately you might have like one web app or server running for each of your classes, you know. Don't go, don't go nuts and just start deploying stuff up there. And it gets you into a bad habit of kind of being lazy with and, and being untidy with your uh, cloud-based stuff, and that can be really dangerous. So try and be uh, mindful of that. So uh, up here in the host, we'll try. I've never managed to be able to connect securely. Um, that may sound strange, but I've never managed to be able to connect securely to. Um, uh, to Azure through FTP through our network here, but uh, I refuse to give up. So we'll copy the FTP host, FTPS host, host name. We'll see if we can do it here. Click that. Okay, so go back to the, uh, this is back on, on um, Azure portal. Uh, for the overview for this app, click on the FTPS. We're gonna try the secure, see if we can get this going here. Change your proto or post, Paste that in the host um, in the host field. Okay. Leave the port. Change the protocol to F. To PS. Change it to SFTP. Although FTPS and SFTP, I think, are two quite different things. Change it to SFTP. Leave the port blank. Uh, change uh, login type from anonymous to normal. So we want to put in our username and password. Right? Now we head back to our, um, our code editor here. And we'll get back into this publish profile document. And the next thing I need is my username. Right. So copy uh, everything you see in between these two quotes. Do not grab the quotes, just everything between the two quotes. And copy that. So this, in fact, the username, this is the uh, service. I think this is the service or the, the app. And this is the, this uh, here means uh, username. I think the way they set it up. And we paste that, get rid of anonymous. 
and paste the username in there. Cool. Delete the password that they provided in here as a placeholder. And, and if you just double click this string, it will automatically connect or highlight everything between the two quotes. Or you can click and drag and just make sure you get it all. Copy that password. I have my doubts this will connect, okay? So we've got our, our host, we've set the protocol to SFTP for secure FTP. You've got our user, normal login type is normal, user is whatever they provided up here, and the second published profile tag here, and the password down here. Go ahead and hit connect. Let's see if I can get connected. Eh, I doubt it. Nope, it's not going to happen. Okay. All right, let's go back to uh, Site Manager. Let's change the protocol. Let's leave it FTP. Yeah, let's leave it FTP. Um, let's leave the default here. FTP and then the encryption require implicit FTP over TLS. No, it's not going to go. Yeah. Back to site manager. I don't think I'm going to be able to connect securely. All right. Use only plain FTP in secure. Generally not good practice. That'll get you connected. Uh, so that, that'll get you connected up to the server now. Um, so bear in mind, I, I would consider, if I was in a production environment, I would now consider that app compromised as soon as I connected that way right be paranoid about security like really um, you know it matters a lot so um, anyway it's something to do with the the way we connect through the network here um, and our firewalls and and the way we're trying to uh, create an encrypted tunnel but anyway so when you're connected now over here of course on the left this means this is this, this is all your stuff on your local file system on the left now here is the file uh, file system and the files for the remote server that you just created on Azure. So the way this is structured is first when you log in you go to a, a, a little slash called root. That's not the root for the hard drive on that server, that's the root for your web app on that server, on that operating system. Um, once you, inside there you've got uh, two options. One is log files. As people are accessing that application, the Windows Server is going to be writing log file access logs in there for user statistics. Okay, uh, you're, unless you're a system administrator, you probably have no business going into the log files, or changing, or manipulating that, or doing anything with it. Um, uh, you might have reason to do that, but make sure you're working with your sysadmin. Uh, go into the the site folder. Okay, so. Um, there's a few folders in here. Um, so these are all kind of pre-built. This is a kind of a boilerplate crafted by uh, the Azure team. Um, so there's some information here about uh, deployments to this particular web app that you created. Um, the locks here, I'm not really sure what that is. Um, it could be something to do with version control that, that they may be using through, um, say, Microsoft Teams or some other product like that. I don't really know. Um, uh, but in here, the tri triple W root, that is what's called the public root of your website or web application. So nobody can browse and look in this stuff using the open internet or the open web, but as soon as you go into triple W root, um, they can browse. This is now a public, publicly available folder. So anything you put in here, people can punch in the URL for this app and they'll browse. So for example, this hosting start file, this page in here, inside the triple W root, this is the same as, this is this page right here, right? And I'll prove that, so I'll say at the end of here, I'll put slash hosting start 
dot HTML. Oh, maybe not. That's interesting. Hmm. Or maybe they, every time you hit it, they give you a different, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, that's that page. There's the hosting start page. I don't know where the other page was. Is they, they haven't got an index page, though, have they? No, nope, there's no index page. Hmm. OK. It's always changing. So that's cool. So that, that is that page there. <clears throat> so this here, this is your, this is the top level domain, azurewebsites.net. And this is your subdomain. So they've carved out a space for you on that domain name server, which directs you to when you type in, someone types that in, it goes to the domain name server and translate that into an internal IP address, which will point them on that data center to that particular virtual machine that is yours. Okay. Cool. So how we move stuff up to here, we find here files on our local file system. So navigate here on your local file system on the left panel of, of FileZilla um, to wherever you downloaded today's lesson files. So I put them on my desktop, for example. Um, or did I yet? No, I didn't download them yet. Ah, I didn't download them. So let's go to blackboard.com, download those lesson files for today. Module 10 and pull down less, uh, the box model. Dot, pull down the lesson files. Make sure you don't grab the lab 10 files. Grab the box model. Dot zip. Put that into module 10. I'll throw this on my desktop because this podium machine isn't mine. Extract the zip. So you should have a folder called box-model. Does, your, does yours have a dat brackets one around it? Yeah, it does. Get rid of the brackets one. That's, that's a mess. I don't know why it does that. Rename that folder box-model. OK? I don't know why it's got the one beside it. My crazy laptop. So that contains our lesson files. We're going to move that box model folder up to the triple W root folder on our Azure machine. So how we do that is we go into here to Azure or to FileZilla. We'll look on the uh, you can you can right click on the screen and hit refresh if you uh, you want to see changes to your local. You have to actually force it. It's not constantly looking at your file system to look for changes. Sometimes you have to hit uh, uh, refresh on either panel here. So refresh. Then we've got up. You can see there's the on um, wherever you put it is the folder called box model, which contains today's lesson. So grab that box model folder and throw it into the triple W root. So click, you can physically drag it over here. So that will throw everything up there, and you can see the FTP log here. How it moved each one of these files inside the box model directory. Right? So now we should have on the left our box model folder and on the right our box model folder. So double click here on the left. Those are our, our the, the files we're working on today. And on the right, inside a box model, which is inside triple W root, you'll see our index page here. Right? So our, our local file system should be the same as our remote file system. Now let's go and see if we can actually browse to this page on the open web. 
So let's head over to our browser again. We'll head up to our page. Instead of hosting start, right, this page here, if we look at FileZilla, corresponds to this page in the triple W root. I want to drill down into the box model and grab this page right here, index.html. So here, that points to that subdomain and top level domain point to the triple W root folder. So in here I'll say slash box dash model slash index.html. And you should get that page there. So everything in white on the address bar is the triple points to the triple W or www root folder here on your server. And then inside that, we're pointing to this file here. And that is FTP with Azure, an Azure web app. Okay. Bear in mind, we're connecting in an insecure fashion here. That's not generally good practice. You would do this, you would at least use um, some sort of encryption with SFTP. Um, a little tricky. You might be able to get that working with um, at home from your from your own personal, using your own personal network. Um, so go ahead and try it. Okay, if it's not working, a couple of things to look for. Uh, is this box model folder inside the triple W root folder. Make sure it is. If, if you stash it up here somewhere, in this, like up in the site folder, you'll never find it. You can't browse to it. This is, you can only browse to stuff that's inside of triple W root. Maybe you, maybe you, when you retyped it, maybe when you gave it a different name, uh, you used a capital B or something like that. I don't know. <coughs> right? Make sure this, this now, uh, Notice how the name of this folder is all lowercase with a dash. We have to start using um, uh, good file naming and folder naming properties because this now becomes part of a URL. Right? Anytime we're, we're deploying folders or files now that are going to sit on a web server in public, they have to be named. Uh, don't put spaces in there. That's going to be a real problem. And, and really, best practice considered, if you need a space, put a dash um, and use lowercase and numbers if you must. Okay. Cool. So if you've got that up and running live, that's good. You earned yourself a coffee. All right. Take a 10 minute break. We'll come back and we'll start uh, we'll start crunching the box model now. Sometime between 12 and 1. Working tomorrow? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's no more. 
Thursday's so talk, we've got a, a, a class to prep for. Yeah. So I've done them together. I have Fridays of how to come up to. I can be pretty flexible on Friday. How's your Friday look? Two or three. Two or three? Yeah. Does that work sometime between now? Yeah, why don't we say two o'clock? Yeah. Yeah, two on Friday. Yep, so your name? Curtis, K U R T S. Last name? Or B E R G. I'll send, no, what's that? Can I give me an email address so you can send the invite to? Curtis Shane Ferg at gmail.com. Sorry again, Curtis G. James? James Ferg at gmail.com. And two o'clock. Yeah. Cool. I'll send that invite right now. Um, I'm trying to set it on Blackboard. Yep. But I keep like the, I know the username's right and I know the passwords are right. And like a billion times and it still says like username's wrong, passwords wrong. Okay. Sure um, I, I could go in to change my passwords and enter your password and that's right. I'm like, well. <laughs> Is this the first day you've had trouble with this? Yeah. Of course, that's not the most. So, have you gone here to the uh, password request password manager? Yeah, I was there. Think of then if that that all that all checks out. Yeah. Um, something weird is going on. I, I would go down to the help desk in the library and there's a desk yeah. in the middle there, the yeah. round desk. And they'll manually reset the password. Okay. And I would go down there. So you think it's the password? I don't know. I have no yeah. idea where that came yeah. from. So it sounds very unusual. I know. So, yeah. Now the password does expire once every two months. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that often catches people off guard. It'll just change, it, it, or it just expires. So now it's great, so you have to kind of go through it every three months. And every, but you usually should get a message or an email that says, hey, your password expired. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, I, would just, I would just run that down there and okay. see if you've got someone to reset, do a hard reset on your password, and okay. they'll say, what do you want it to be? Uh, so yeah. Hey, yeah. nice. okay. um, my Azure is on there. Yeah. I try to get the web thing. Okay. Yeah, so that's not going to work. Yeah, so there's something there's something that's not set up properly with your Azure. Okay. Yeah, so we'll need to make an appointment. It'll take about 20 minutes. Okay. To get fixed. So, how does your week look coming up? Mm, looks fine. Yeah. Okay. I got. Um, like I have some time tomorrow, say 12:30. Tomorrow, 12:30. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's different. Yeah, the thing I want to talk about is password thing. Yes. Yes. Um, I wasn't aware there was a few months. I I got the dates mixed up. So all the classes they have like so. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I didn't end up having to. It's like I I I, I, I can't um that's the last minute, so I didn't end up. So I just I just I logged today on like Blackboard and then I just saw I was like oh do except for yeah. Okay. Well, get it done. Um, yeah. you know if um. I'll, I'll, we'll kind of think about what's kind of a reasonable kind of uh, kind of late penalty for it, but I'll take it and I'll mark it. So, okay. get it done. Right. so sorry, your name is? Uh, Jennifer. Jennifer. J E N N. J E N A N. Yeah, T H A N. Okay, and last name? A N T O N Y. Uh, space. J E Y. J E Y. J E Y. J E Y. A K A. N T H. Yeah. Uh, email address. I can send it to you. Uh, 
soon email my first so, so, so offer so it's all it looks like so it's Oh, it's not that your subscription is not working. Yeah, so we've got a number of people still still struggling to get that crazy stuff working. I know it's a pain. So maybe we'll need about 20 minutes to sit down um, just to kind of go over it. So if you have any time, um, tomorrow is, are you around tomorrow afternoon? No, not here tomorrow. So what about Wednesday? No, sorry, Saturday. Wednesday afternoon, are you around? Okay. Yeah. So let me put you in um, at 2 o'clock. For 2 o'clock, 2.33. 2 o'clock? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's your email address? Y. Y. U. R. This one here? Yeah. Yeah. Cool, okay. we'll get you we'll get to All right, let's, uh, let's take a look at some of the CSS and uh, see about moving it up to the server. <clears throat> so crack open your code editor again. We'll head back here to, uh, you don't need this published settings. Once, you, once you've got, once your app is deployed on, uh, on Azure, on the cloud, and once you have, um, once you've got that saved in FileZilla, Right, once you've got an in site manager, which we do here, you can you can add multiple sites in here with different connection credentials in FileZilla, and you can come back. So once once you've got that in place, you don't need to, to change it. Um, so we're connected here. So we'll have our FileZilla here. Uh, we, we can close this out. I don't need this anymore. And we'll uh, open a new folder for today's work. New project folder. I'll open up the box model folder. Get rid of the welcome page. And we can open up index.html. <coughs> So I'll walk you through the, the HTML quickly. I've, uh, remember the base language on the page, whatever that is, on your HTML tag. You have the head section, the body, inside the body. In this case, I've got a div ID container. It's very common. Um, inside that, we have a page level header, a page level main, and a page level footer with some <coughs> fine print with the small. I close out the main container for the page, close the body, close the HTML. No tricks. Um, inside the main section, I've got uh, one, two, three section elements. Right? Each section has a new subheading right? and some text. So we'll just use these elements kind of as a playground to kind of take a look and see what what those different parts of the box model are and how they work and how that changes the rendering on the screen. Cool. Step one, never ever trust 
a piece of HTML that anyone gives you, ever, even if it's from me. But Scott, yeah, no, don't know. Check it out, right? I make mistakes all the time, right? Sometimes I don't have my morning coffee. Well, actually, usually I do, but uh, sometimes I don't have my third or my fourth, and then things go bad, right? So uh, I can mess up my HTML. Validate your HTML. Always check it out. So, so you can do a couple things. Let's head over to the validator. W3.org. By now, you should probably commit that URL to memory. Now, a couple of things you can do here. If you've, if you've successfully deployed uh, this uh, up on Azure websites, you can copy the URL and you can paste that validate by URI or URL in here. And we can check and we can check it on Azure. So it'll actually look up the site as it exists on Azure. Okay? Or uh, you can, if you don't have it up on Raja, you can use file up by file upload and check it that way. Tomato, tomato, right? Go ahead and fix that HTML. Make it good. I gave you bad code, man. Validate it, fix it. Once you found the problem, clean it up, save it, file save. Now, if you're up on the server, we're going to have to check. We've now fixed this file, right? If I refresh this page, you'll see here um, the last modified time is different now than the last modified time on the server, right? See how they're different? And also the file size. After changing this, the file size is slightly different than the one on the server. So to replace that, I can right click this and hit upload. Now the the FTP client's going to be, it's going to complain about this because it's going to say, whoa, whoa, you can't upload this file. It already exists on the server. You're going to blow away your file, right? Because we're not using version control like git we're not using it. these are kind of uncontrolled documents if they were so it's uh, so it, it attempts to at least warn you that you what you could be doing is potentially very destructive um, so it says whoa this file already exists um, so here's the source file that we're uploading here's the target file up on the server um, what do you want to do do you want to overwrite it overwrite it if the source is newer overwrite it if it's a different oh. size so on and so forth and then it says, uh, do you always want to use this action? So do you want to avoid this dialog in the future? Uh, maybe you don't mind getting pestered every time. I usually say always use, but uh, if I'm in a, any kind of production environment or even in a staging or a, a testing environment, probably just letting, letting, uh, allowing this to happen automatically every time I move a file up might be destructive. So I'll just say overwrite, okay. The file goes up. If I refresh this side here, you'll see now the file size should match. And the last modified time, that's a little different because I just I saved it here and then moved it over here. That's fine. That's cool. So now I've uploaded the new file. So now I can go. Um, I'll paste and I'll check it on the server and I should be good if all things good. Okay.
Or if you, uh, if you don't have Azure up and running, just go by file upload. You can just choose the file again, hit check, and you should be good as long as you've saved it. Always validate your HTML. Okay. So if you don't, if you don't have, and again, if you don't have uh, this up and running on on Azure, just open up. Excuse me, just open up a new tab, Control O, and find the page and open it up. Okay, everything. You just have to save your file and refresh. A lot of web front end stuff we can do locally anyway. We can test it locally before we move it up to. Um, a staging server, or a testing server, uh, or anything like that. Okay, cool, done, validate. Now, step two, let's link to the external CSS. It's not considered good practice uh, to have your cascading style sheets part of your HTML. They should be separate wherever possible. So let's go ahead, we have a CSS, if you look at the folder system here, I've got a, uh, a file called app.css. So this is the application CSS file. Uh, let's link to that, like we did last week. Link uh, href. Make sure you don't type a herf. I get a lot of herfs. Ah, oh, my CSS doesn't work because you've got a herf. Oh, huh. Get you every time. So from here, what's the path? Where do I go? It's a relative path. That's not really a trick question. I'll show you why in a second. We need to define the relationship. That will work. Now, if, it's, if this uh, CSS is for screen viewing, we really should say, we really should be precise about that. Um, also, um, if you're using XML style syntax, which I am being inconsistent here, which is bad, that's bad form, all empty elements should either be XML style syntax with the little uh, slash and space thing in the end, um, or not. I don't know why I forgot it up there. I like, it. I like XML style syntax. Just be consistent. Okay, that's cool. No, that's all I want. All right, so I've, I've saved that. Now if you head over here, we've, we've changed this uh, file again. So I'll upload CSS or index.html to overwrite this one. And then I'll reload the page on the Azure web server. Everything should be good. It shouldn't change dramatically, if at all. Um, that's cool. Now. You can, if you want, this you this is a relative path, right? Um, so this is like relative to where index is. We go from here to there to get to the file. If we want, it's on a server. So I can do, and you may see this from time to time, I can instead, the path to the CSS, if I look on the, uh, if I look here, um, the CSS folder is here. And there's app.css on the server. So I can actually plot out an absolute path to that CSS file on the server. So what I can do is I can say, OK, box model slash CSS slash app.css. There's my CSS file. Right? So what I can do is I can actually put in if I want. And sometimes this makes sense for some applications. It depends on what you're doing. Instead of this, I can put in the absolute reference to my CSS because it's on a server. That will have the same result. Right? Absolute relative. Right? That's cool. Let's take a look at app.css. Or do I have any more steps? No, no, that's it. So let's head over to app.css. Okay. Step three, set the character encoding. Must be the first line of the file. What? Yeah, remember over here, we set the character encoding to Unicode text format or text, Unicode text 8-bit, uh, UTF-8. 
it's generally considered good practice to set the character set with an at car set inside your CSS. Believe it or not. Why? Why? Why would I do that? Well, sometimes CSS can be used to generate characters in your document. Cool. All right. Step 4A. Let's get into box model now. Let's set the border properties on the div ID container. First, I'll get my uh, close this, view my on the div ID container. So if we look at when you're doing your CSS, it's always helpful to have your uh, HTML handy at your fingertips. So the div ID container, in this case, is a element that surrounds everything on the page inside the body. So everything is inside that box. So we'll create a, a selector div and we'll use, if we want to talk to the ID, I use a hash mark, div ID container. Open up your curly brace, close your curly brace. Okay, so we're going to create a, we're going to talk to the, we're going to speak to the border property of this. So we'll set, that first of all, there's a number of different properties for border. We're going to start with border, uh, let's set up the border um, dash uh, width. And we'll set it to five pixels. You can use uh, percent, you can use M's, a typographic unit of measure for sizing things. You can use inches, millimeters, picas. Uh, VWs, which is viewport width, VH, viewport height, you can set a percentage of the viewport height. There's all kinds of, any measure in CSS that you can use, you can use to set the border width. So that's cool. We'll save that. Now in FileZilla, this is a little bit different. Um, I'm now, I'm not changing this any longer, right? First of all, uh, I'll, I'll upload this again. I can also just drag this over here. I've changed my index.html. Um, we're now changing the CSS. So now I need to go into the CSS folder on my local system here and the CSS folder on my remote system so that this can upload and replace uh, the app.css here. Yeah, I know it exists. Yes, please overwrite it. That's cool. Um, Oops. I'll reload the page on, on Azure and there's no no border. Why? Huh? That's weird. Because we haven't been uh, our definition is even complete. We need to now talk about the border style. The border style, let's say we can say solid. We can also say dashed, dotted, double, inset. Outset for those cheesy 3D stuff if you're into that 90s kind of early CSS type thing. Um, whatever. Um, save that. Push this up again to the server. That will not do anything. Oh, it did. I lied. Yes, the default color is black. So without, at minimum, you need to specify how wide the border is and the style. I can change it to dash, dashed, if I want. I'm going to I'm going to select always use this action, recognizing that that's dangerous. But I'm just speed things up a little bit here. And there's dashed. Dotted. Uh, of course, if you change the, uh, oops, 
You can change the size. I can say uh, 20 pixels. You're going to get a much different result. There's also double, double line, inset, outset. There's number. So we'll leave it solid for now at five pixels. And I'll also change the color. Save it up. Yep. Yeah. Question? Yeah. Um, could you not do all three of those properties in like the same uh, uh, tree, I guess? Would you say those two? It's like all three of those instead of go like solid five pixel and then the rest. I like the way you're thinking. Yes. <laughs> This is actually a waste of, uh, waste of bandwidth. So yeah, so uh, all of these things, of course, um, would be much better. Can't we just use a shorthand? Sure. So the border property. Now the border property, they have to be in, the properties can be listed in one line, in one declaration, but they have to be in a certain order, or it doesn't work. Uh, you can omit properties, but they still have to be in that very specific order. So the uh, it looks like this. So we can say, let's say 10px, Let's say dashed, dashed orange. Shorthand, very useful. The only down, downside to shorthand really is there aren't many. Okay. Notice how because um, this is later in the order, it cascades over these prior rules. So this wins, right? The only, the only downside, I guess, to um, uh, using shorthand is uh, if you, you, sometimes you have to look up in a, uh, you know, uh, in a reputable uh, reference. So if I say uh, MDN uh, or CSS, If you forget the order of these things, sometimes you need to look up a reputable reference like MDN or Google Developers or Microsoft Developers Network. Um, so the property value is a border width, border style, border color. So um, that's cool. Um, now we can independently, we can independently, um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll comment out these. And if you select the lines and go control right leaning slash or command right leaning slash, uh, most code editors will, will add a comment delimiter. So commenting in CSS and HTML a little different. Uh, CSS is slash star to, to begin a comment and star slash to end a comment. It's multi-line capable. So by commenting them out, and very often if you're doing a lot of experimentation with CSS, it's a good idea to um, use comments to. Yep. Um, so the from the border to shorthand is so dash it would be shorthand for border style, orange would be shorthand for the border color. That's right. Okay. And yep. What's the ten? Ten px is border width. Uh, yep. Yeah. So you don't actually need to put the specific property in there, it, it understands it due to the order that they appear in the border declaration. That's a good question. And that's why, yeah, if you get the order wrong, it won't work. So you, that's why oftentimes it's a little, it's, it's using shorthand is less friendly CSS from a, from a maintenance perspective, but it is it does save, save on bandwidth. Like if you can imagine all the properties being written out longhand, you could save thousands of lines of code in, in a large application, right? Um, so it is, wor it is worth it. Um, so I can say this. I can say border, border uh, dash top, uh, and I can say dash width. I can say 10px, border top uh, style. 
Double. There we go. So you're not always left with uh, having to, to add borders. Um, I guess I have to upload my refresh CSS. So you can control one, top, left, bottom, right, absolutely. Any of these uh, independently. That's cool. Um, it's another thing that you can do. You can say uh, border. We can also, yeah, we could also say, let's just say the, um, it's, we just said border. Uh, let's, let's, I'm going to comment this out here. I'll uncomment this one. Whoops, now I made a real mess of things. Let's restore the border 10 pixel dashed orange. Okay, I can do that. And then I can say, well, I don't want all of the borders 10 pixels in width. I can set the border dash width. And I can set them to, let's say, top would be 10 pixel. The right would be 20 pixel. The bottom would be 30 pixel. And the left would be 40 pixel. Step four, C. So this is called uh, trouble. Top, right, bottom, left. If you're using the, uh, so this is called the shorthand, the clock rule. So if you look at a, if you have a clock there, you have top, right, bottom, left. Just look at the clock. And that's how you remember, remember uh, the order of those things. Not to say you should do that, I'm just saying that's how it works. Okay. I've never tried it with color though. Border color. Uh, orange. Red. I never tried. I never tried that. There you go. So you really have uh, all all uh, manner of uh, flexibility in terms of the uh, uh, independent uh, independently styling the borders on all four sides of any element. Period. Right. We are using the this div container. Right. But we could just as easily set that on an H3. Or a paragraph element, right? And we'll do, we'll do so. We'll, we'll target other elements here. <clears throat> all right. Let's uh, instead of having it all kind of wacky, let's uh, let's control. Let's tone this down a bit and put one border, and we'll say uh, 10 px uh, solid gray, just so it's not too distracting. So 10 pixels solid gray. That's cool. So that's for C. Shorthand. We covered shorthand. Uh, shorthand, you can also, uh, um, I guess what I didn't uh, cover as well, let me just uh, cover the, the different permutations of the shorthand. So if it's, uh, and this applies to any property, uh, uh, border dash width, for example. So if I say border width, if I say uh, 
uh, 10px, and then I say uh, 30px. If I shorten that to 2, that means top and bottom, left and right. Maybe it's, it's not entirely intuitive, but uh, it's very common. Because very commonly, with a layout, you're going to do this, where you're going to have a same, the same value for your left and right as the top and bottom. So um, that's how shorthand it works. If you have two figures, that's top and bottom, left and right. Okay. If you have, um, obviously you have one, we've, we've done one, one is for all four. Uh, if we do three, Um, I always forget how this works again. Um, I forget now. Always forget this. I have to upload it to remember how this works. I don't know why three confounds me, but it does. Right, so um, when we have three, it's kind of, this is top, Left and right, bottom. Now that I, now that I see that, that makes sense. Because very often you're going to have the top, the left and right will be the same, and the bottom might be different than the top. I guess that makes sense. I always forget, I always forget how that works. I don't use that very often. Okay. Cool. All right, set the padding values on the div container out. So get rid of that. So all, all our, our now our div ID container box here should simply have a border 10 pixel solid gray. So comment out all the other stuff. I'll comment out that. Shift or control, right leaving slash. I'll leave it all in there so, and, uh, so you can come back and look at that and play around with it. Um, so the padding value, so now if you remember, this was the, we were manipulating the red box here, the border. Maybe we should change this to red so you can kind of, I don't know. <clears throat> okay, um, let's take a look at the, um, at the padding values on the div container element. So let's go in here and we'll create another selector div ID container. <coughs> Their selector. <clears throat> the only reason I'm separating these out here is just for because we're talk talking about padding down here, we're talking about border up here. Generally, I would put this in the same uh, rule, right? Share these two things. So I'm just I'm just busting it up just so we can get our uh, just because we've kind of broken up that way. So let's take a look at padding. Now let's set padding to, oh, I don't know, 10% uh, this time. <clears throat> Save that. So now you can see that um, uh, there's the border and the padding because I've said it. I just set one value. It's actually shorthand. That means top, right, bottom, and left are all the same. They're all 10%. You'll notice it because I'm using a relative unit. When I shrink the page, of course, 10% of its container, which is the window object, uh, is becomes smaller as you shrink it down. So that is a what's called a relative unit of measure. I can use pixels if I want, doesn't matter, and that would be a fixed, so say 30 pixels. And once you do that, you'll notice that it is a fixed. The padding does not change <coughs> as I resize the box. 30 pixels is 30 CSS pixels. I don't care how wide the window is. Right? Fixed unit of measure. 
Uh, I can just, and just the same as um, border, I can say padding dash top. I can set that to, I don't know, maybe the top I want it to be a bit bigger. So I'll leave this, but this will trump, uh, this is later in the order, so this will cascade over the, uh, the prior declaration. And there I have a slightly bigger padding on the top, and all right, bottom, and left are all still 30 pixels. So you have that, it's exactly the same as, um, except there's no style to the padding. Right? You can't add, it's not like the, because the border is technically like a line, right? You can't, there's no style. But what we can do is we could, a, we could put a, um, a background color. And it's really important to understand that the background color fills any visible padding and any also behind any text. So the background color of the element is the padding zone of the box. Now you can't see that very well, can you? I want a yellow, but I don't want like the pure yellow because it burns your eyes. If it's a yellow, all right, whatever. Uh, I'll use yellow. Sure. Ah, not that you should do that. That's terrible. I guess I can just choose a, a hexadecimal value for that. That's better. So hexadecimal colors are base 16. So FC is the red channel. FC is the green channel. RGB is the blue channel. Oops, I messed it up. Had a nice yellow. All right, there we go. That's a bit better. Cool. So the other interesting thing that we can do uh, with the background, with the padding area, is set a background image inside it. And uh, so that's helpful. So if you'll notice inside the, um, so inside the, uh, in the included files, I've got an images folder. And in here I've got, um, say, a stucco.jpg. You see, I've kind of got a, uh, a background tile that if you repeated this element, uh, it stacks up again. It matches perfectly, right? Like a floor tile. So it's kind of just a, it's kind of a, a texture. It doesn't show up that well on the screen, but you kind of see it probably on your screen. Uh, let's let's apply that to the div container and see how that works. So. Uh, back to uh, app.css and let's say background dash image and this time we use a URL and then I like to use quotes you don't have to and then uh, the important thing to remember is is we're not embedding the image right in the CSS we're referencing it it's a different type of media right so this URL has to refer to either an absolute or a relative path from the CSS to the image that I want, not from the HTML. And that might be a bit, sometimes people get hung up on that. They, they, they want a background image on their page and they put the path from the HTML template to the image, but it's actually from the, the CSS is the file that's calling it. So the CSS, we have to go up one directory into the box model directory and then into the images directory and then grab uh, stucco.jpg. So this is how it works. So we need to go, a relative path would be like dot dot slash up one directory 
into images, and then stucco.jpg, semicolon. Okay. Now, the image, from a server perspective, if you look, when I uploaded the whole box model directory, I already threw the images folder up on the server. It's already there, right? So all I have to do now is upload my revised CSS, and that should take care of that. So now this image is tiled across the image. Okay, how it tiles is with background repeat. So if you don't say anything about the image at all, it will repeat horizontally and vertically, endlessly, right? So if you don't want that, you set background repeat to no dash repeat. You think it'd be true and false, but no. It's background repeat, repeat is default. Background repeat, no repeat means repeat once, or don't repeat, or whatever. I'd prefer true and false there, but that's, that's not the way the spec works. So if I do that, then of course, then you only Background repeat, no repeat, will you'll have one instance of the image and that's it. <clears throat> okay. I can also uh, position the image. I can position the X, the Y, or I can position both. Background position, I can say X. Let's say 250 px from the left, uh, whoops, and uh, maybe 100 pixels uh, from the top, x, y. So I can plot this anywhere I want inside of the parent HTML container, whatever that is. I'm using a div. But you can use a paragraph or a heading, or I want you to think about the various creative possibilities when I, when I, I, I can now do that. There it is. Okay. Now I can also use a relative unit of measure to position that. So I can say, well, why don't I, let's go, um, I don't know, let's say 50% of the width of the, from the X, uh, and leave this, I'll leave this 100 from the top. But let's say horizontally 50%. So I don't have to hard code that value. So now, as I refresh size the, the element, that the position of that background element will remain at 50%, whatever that might be. The reason, there's a couple of reasons. One of the reasons why this red box is expanding and contracting is because we haven't set a width on it. If in the absence of any width, if any, any element is a, what we call a block level container or a box, it will say, I'm going to be 100, it, they're very greedy, and they say, I want 100% of the width of the room, whatever I can, I can take, I'll take it, and I'll force everything before me and after me to bump to a new line. That's called display block. So this div, is a block level element and it will do that, right? We'll, we'll get into width uh, shortly. Um, you'll also notice there's a little bit of space here. That's because the default um, on most browsers, they don't want to see you have text bumped up right up hard against an edge of a page. So they'd like you to, um, it, what it does is it puts in a default, the default style sheet, a little bit of margin and or padding on the body. You can make that go away. You can blow that away if you want. Um, but they leave that in as a default. So that's why that's there. 
Cool. Background position. Uh, background size. Um, another thing that might be important is uh, maybe you want to uh, Maybe you want the background size to uh, um, to cover the entire element. So you say cover Oh, I guess I have to push up to the server. Nope. Did I not save it? Maybe I didn't save it. Oh, did it? Yeah. All right. There you go. So now this will cover. Now, the only thing, because I positioned it down from the top, it'd probably be a good idea to comment that out. So now what happens is, no matter what the size or aspect ratio of the element, that picture will cover the background. It will cover all parts of the padding, right? Irrespective of how big it is natively in terms of its a bitmap, right? Um, so uh, that's really, really cool. Um, contain is a little different. The differences are, are subtle, but they are there. It does so. If I say contain, what that means is, no matter what the aspect ratio or the height width of this thing is, um, you will always see the entire image. It will be contained by the board. Okay, so those are two very different uh, kind of ways to place that element in the document. background image. There you go, background image. That's cool. All right, six. OK, now we, get, now we get into widths. Cool, so it's 2 o'clock, top of the hour. I owe you another break, like I always uh, try and bust up my class into three bits so people don't uh, see your brain doesn't uh, crash on you. Okay. So go and find yourself a coffee or get a stretch or whatever. We'll come back, and we'll start to look at crazy units, sizing things, and then tearing them out of the flow of the page and moving them around on the page. All right, so let's uh, let's see what else, what other things we can do with this crazy box model. You'll see it's it's pretty it's pretty flexible. Um, so step six a, we're on on step six. Let's control the width of the div container with a fixed unit. So right now, if we look at the uh, the div with the uh, red box, um, it's uh, if I don't say anything, it goes with the hundred percent. You know, this little white space notwithstanding. Um, it goes with 100%. So if I want to control the width of that, I can. I can simply go into, um, you know, I, I, sh I would put this in div container, but I'm trying to break these into different rules. So let's go uh, uh, div, div ID container. And I can say width. Use the width property. I can say, ah, let's say 500 pixels. So we'll use a fixed unit of measure. Upload that to the server. Refresh the page. So what happens is, uh, in this case, it's like, oh, OK, well, I can only be 
Now it's, it, it really doesn't matter what the size of the parent, the container is, which is in this case the document window or the, uh, the window object. Uh, it's 500 pixels in width, period. Um, so what it does is the height is auto. So what it does is it just, it says, well, I've only got this, this much width, so let's just keep bumping this down until we're done the content. That's a good thing, right? If you squish something this way, it's kind of, you can imagine a, a water balloon, right? You squash it this way, it's going to get more kind of elongated this way. So think of, thinking of your content as water inside of these containers is probably a good way to, to really visualize that because um, the browser's built to, the idea is it wants you to read the content, right? That, that, the idea is it doesn't want to cut any of it off or trim any of it away. So um, we can set, but we can set the width in other ways. We can use, um, there's different units. We can use an absolute or a fixed unit. We could use a percentage, which is very common, particularly as we get, say, 80%, particularly as we get into like a more of a mobile uh, centric kind of, um, or I should say mobile. We don't know now um, what kind of device people are going to be using, right? So um, very often, and you'll see how that the, the content reflows as it as it needs to, and the height all obviously adjusts because the height the height is automatic, right? Uh, height by default the height is auto, and by default the width is 100 percent. That's the way. Um, the box model is built without any changes. So that's all right. Go back to it. Step C. So we can also use an elastic unit of measure. So we've got a fixed unit, a relative unit of measure, like a like a hundred eighty uh, percent. Uh, oh, I should also say there's a there's a relatively new unit of measure called uh, viewport width. So if I go um, at eight. I think it's 8VH. Um, I think that means, I'm trying to think now, is it 0.8? This is, a new, this is a new one that I haven't really used. Anyway, you can use a viewport width. I think it's, I can't recall now. I think it's 80 or is it 8? I can't remember how it works. I'll find out in a second because I'm going to break it. Yeah, so uh, that's basically that means 80% uh, of the viewport width, and that's that's important because sometimes you don't want to. If I say 80%, um, I'm saying 80% of the container of this element, right? Sometimes if you think about the nested structure of HTML, some things are nested deep inside other elements, right? Sometimes I want 80% of the viewport itself, the, the document, not the container it's in. So that's anyway. Let's leave that. I'll put 75 or 75 percent. Um, what we can do, or we can change that instead of the, uh, a percentage, we can use a um, uh, an elastic unit. So let's say um, 30 ems. An m is a typographic unit of measure. It's one font size. So um, what I'm saying is then set the width of the container to 30 of whatever the font size is for this container. So now you're making the size of it dependent on the font size, which is kind of an interesting thing if we think about, uh, uh, particularly if we're thinking about elements that are largely text-based. Um, that means if I, it was to, if I was to change the font size up a little bit, so let's change the font size just above here font size, let's say 150%. Let's make the font size one and a half times bigger. That means this 1EM is one and a half times bigger than it was before, right? This may sound a bit strange. You may be scratching your head going, why would I ever do that? Well, sometimes we want visual elements on the page to be sized in accordance with the type that they contain. So I want there to be a relationship between the size of a panel and the font size used for the content in such, set, such a panel. This is called elastic, right? where the font size kind of controls the layout to some degree. 
So there's there's three kind of different scenarios. They're all they're all useful in certain uh, contexts. There is no right or wrong way to size an element. Uh, you know, it just depends on on the interface you're building. Um, I'll comment that out because that's going to <coughs> that's going to mess me up a little bit here. Uh, let's comment that out, and we'll just set this to with let's say. Um, Now, I'll talk. I'll do a little talk a little bit about margins quickly. Um, so this is fine. Let's set it to eighty percent. I'll reload the page. So there's my my element is eighty percent wide, right? What if I wanted um, to add a little bit of space on the left here, so I can add a margin to that element? So off we go. Let's put. Let's add a margin, and I'll say margin dash left, and I'll say 10%. What does that look like? <clears throat> well, there we go. <coughs> now, these aren't equal here. These two margins here. Uh, that's a very common requirement with layout, is whereby we want to have a, an element on the page. It may be, uh, you know, it might expand and contract based on the size of the page, but I want it to be centered in the page. So uh, I can kind of, I, I guess I could do margin left and margin right. Uh, I could do this. This would do, this might seem to. Sound okay? Seems logical. Did it not go? Did I drop my connection? Margin, <clears throat> right margin hmm. That should produce a horizontal scroll bar, but it is not. Weird. See if I can even change this. Hold on a sec. <clears throat> oh yeah. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so I can do that if these totals add up to more than 100%, which they do in this case. Um, then what's going to happen is you're going to get horizontal scrolling. Right? That makes sense. Uh, I'm bigger than 100%. So um, the idea here, if I want to automatically center, even if I were to put 10% and 10%, this isn't going to work, right? Uh, if I want to fit something inside the container, and I'll tell you why. Um, let's see if I can get that horizontal scroll bar. I don't know why I can't. Well, it's not, it's, I guess it's just cheating a little bit. Um, but the problem is, <clears throat> if this container here, remember it's the content <clears throat> that I'm talking about, right? Because I have padding. So the content is, is 80%. The margins 10 and 10, that's 100%. But then I have to add the padding and the border as well. So now I'm over 100%. Also, they're in pixels. Like some of the borders in here are also in... I've set the uh, padding. Padding, yeah. My padding is in pixels, and my other widths are in percentage. So I'm mixing fixed units of measure with percentages. That's the mathematics become a little bit difficult to work with, right? So 
<clears throat> anyway, so I want to horizontally, I come back to this challenge. If I wanted to horizontally center uh, this here, what I can do is I can say margin. I can use the margin shorthand. I can say the margin top, let's say, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, 25 px. Margin right, auto. Margin bottom, 50 px. And margin left, auto. If the left and the right margins are both automatic and there's space left over, what it does splits the difference. So if I split the difference, what do I affect on a, on a, on a uh, element that's less wide than the window? I get an automatically centered layout. So whatever this width is, this is 80% of the content, add on the padding and the box, <clears throat> then it just says, I don't know, whatever is left over here and here, just split it between the two left and right, and you're good to go. Why bother doing the math? Let the browser do that. <clears throat> okay, so that's cool. Let's set this back to a fixed unit of measure. So set the width back to 500 px. Now it's uh, 500 pixels fixed, but it's automatically centered because the width on the left and right are auto. That's kind of cool. Now, what should happen, this is great, so I crunch this down to 500 pixels in width, and it's like, well, that's fine, I'll just adjust the height to fill so I can, the content can flow. What if the content doesn't fit? What if I actually change the height and the width of the element? So we're going to, step 7a, we're going to set the height so the content no longer fits. So let's set the width, let's set the height to 400 px. Now it won't fit. Upload to server. Now we have what's called a blowout. So it's like, all right, well, I guess, I guess the box is 400 high. Here you go. But the idea, though, browsers are, are, are they're kind of amazing pieces of software in the sense that um, it, a browser will do its very best to make the content consumable or understandable. So it's like, well, unless you tell me, I'm not going to clip the content away and hide it. I'm just going to let it flow outside of the box. Because the user, you prob the designer probably intended for the user to read that, even though they didn't quite do the math properly. So it, it, it's, in a way, it fails gracefully enough. Although this looks awkward, um, it does. Um, so there's a number of things that we can do. Um, so there's different things we can do to the overflow property to handle if we have a situation where a thing is not big enough to uh, to contain all the stuff inside it. So we can talk about this using uh, something called overflow. All right, we can say overflow and we can say Hidden. If you put overflow hidden, it will trim it off. All right. Maybe uh, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. Uh, however, uh, sometimes you may want um, you may want to do something else. You may want to uh, apply a scroll bar to overflow. This is useful if you have a very limited amount of space in a, in a, on a screen that you're designing for, and you have content that you know is too big for said uh, uh, whatever that panel or box is. So you want to add a scrolling capability. All 
and then they can scroll. And it will work excellent. You can handle uh, overflow X. So you can also do, uh, just do overflow, say I can just do overflow y, uh, y vertically. If I say overflow Y, I'll only get a vertical scroll bar. You may not want that, that this, if you say auto that it will, or if you just say scroll, it will, it will put a scroll bar on both sides whether or not it needs it. So that's, that's helpful to know, right? Cool. Okay, let's size this thing back up to, uh, let's go back up to a, a width of 80%. Let's um, comment out the height, let the height, or I'll let you see that height is actually auto. I can actually set the height to auto, which is the default. I actually don't, you actually don't need to put height auto unless you're trying to cascade over a previous rule where you've already set, fixed the height, and you're trying to, to defeat that rule. Then you have to set it back to auto. So. If I set the width back to 80% and the height back to auto, we'll get 80% width and then the height will scroll. Now I've still got the scroll bar here because I've set the overflow to overflow X, right, to scroll. Um, it won't need to with height auto, but it will put the scroll bar there for you because of that property. Comment that out. Cool. All right, we're almost there. <clears throat> so, um, overflow. Oh, um, dis display property. Okay. Let's talk about display. Let's take a look at, we're going to look at another uh, element, the H1EM. So, let's take a look at our HTML. And um, you see how we have an element, an emphasized element inside a primary heading element. So this is nested inside here, right? We're going to target this with a CSS selector. Um, so what we can do is we can look and say, okay, this M is inside of an H1. So let's take a look at a, our CSS. And we'll say h1 space em. So this means any em element that is contained within an h at one element. Okay, because there's that, there may be other emphasis elements on the page, but I just want to target the one in the primary heading. So your selectors have to be very specific, or as specific as they need to be to target what you want to style, but no more specific. So let's set the display property, display. Well, first of all, let, let's, uh, let's put, um, let's put a, uh, a background color on this. Background color, and we'll put a uh, background color of um, light blue, for example. Just so we can see it. Now you'll notice something really interesting about this crazy thing. No fire, no, did I get, no upload for me. There we go. So you'll notice something really interesting about this emphasis element, as different than the div container that contains the whole page. This thing is only as wide as it needs to be to encapsulate. It's not width 100%. It's only wide enough to encapsulate um, the content. The, the width is auto rather than 100%. That's because this element is display uh, inline by default instead of display block. Okay. 
If I change this to display block, something very interesting happens. Okay, so set the emphasis element to display block. Suddenly, you'll see what happens. Anything that's display block will be suddenly with 100%. So what it does is it goes, it says, I'm a block level element. I need, to, I need to take my own line. I'll force prior content to a line above me. And I'll force content after this element to a new line underneath me. So you can see now, and that's why I set the, the, the background color, so you can see that it goes 100% of its container. Now it goes 100% of its container uh, right up to the edge of the padding of the div. Right, because it's only the content zone of the div that that element is sitting is 100% wide, right? So that's cool. I, now that this is now the difference between display, why would something be display inline? Some elements are display inline, and they're inline because uh, they they are just that. They may be a phrasing element. In this case. Um, when I'm emphasizing a word within a sentence, I want it to sit in line with the other words in, in that content. So I don't necessarily want that to break everything else to a new line. Some elements like larger sectioning elements, like sections and headings and headers and footers and things like that, they're, they're bigger boxes that usually contain other pieces of content. But when I get into phrasing elements that are meant to mark up like, you know, Q elements, like quotes, um, uh, you know, B elements, bolded elements, they are in line, right? So they 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 don't they don't have all of the characteristics of the box model, unless you tell them, no, no, display as a block. Then you get then all of a sudden all of this turns on and you, you're able to control the height, the width, and all that kind of stuff. Now I can also do something very interesting with the display um, property. I can set something to display none. What does that do? That sounds crazy. So when I display none, it is actually removed from the flow of the page. Okay, the, 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 now it's still in the HTML. So if I was to inspect this element, right click and inspect the element, I'm in Chrome here. You can see there's the H1, there it is. It's still here in my HTML, but the page is display is not displaying it. Okay, that's important. Here's the difference. Um, you can, I can, let's just say you uh, display uh, inline. I'll just leave that. You don't actually have to say that. It's, uh, it's by default, it's display inline. I can set this to visibility. Display none and visibility hidden are two different things. Visibility hidden, Neither one of these affect the HTML. The HTML, it's still there in the markup. It just affects the way it's rendered on the page. Visibility hidden, it's still there in the HTML, but with hidden, the space that it otherwise would have occupied is still reserved for it. It still sits there. It's like, it just turns it on or off, right? Uh, visibility none takes it out of the flow of the document, and everything is like, I guess it's left, the, I guess the M elements left the party. All right. And, and it kind of gobbles up that space. So they're two, they're two quite different things, ways of concealing content. Kind of nuts, but anyway. <clears throat> Visibility. <clears throat> All right, so set the width of the three section elements and arrange them with the display property, then with float. Uh, so we'll do one more thing. So. If I wanted to arrange uh, a number of boxes side by each to create, say, a multi-column layout, right? So imagine if I look at the three sections here in the main, right? And instead of having them in one column, as I have on my page, uh, I'd like to arrange them in three different columns inside the div ID container, okay? Well, each of these section elements are display block. That means they're with 100%. If you, don't, if you don't believe me, that's cool. Nor should you. Let's check it out. Let's go ahead and um, 
set the so these section elements let's use a selector we can say main, I only want the section elements that are inside the main part of the page so my selector goes like this main section so this means any section element that is contained by a main element that's it that'll hit all three section elements because that's true for all of them they're all contained by a main element Let's say border uh, 5px solid purple. No accounting for taste. So there they are. I'll get rid of this here. So each one of those section elements are a box. They're 100% of the width of their container. In this case, the container is the div ID container. They go right to the edge of the padding of that container, right? So if I wanted to arrange them side by each, they would have to be not 100%, but less than 100%, so there's space. So let's go ahead and, and change the width of those. Um, let's set the width. and let's say 30%. So each of those will be 30% of the width of their containing element. But they still stack vertically. Right? <clears throat> So what I have to do is now I have to now I have to do a number of things. I have to um, I have to make some decisions. How am I going to arrange those in, in three columns? Well, um, we can use uh, we can use something called a float, which will achieve the result. And a float is where we, uh, if we and again we're using the metaphor of water. That's why I like using water as for content. So I can say to um, I can say to the, this element here. Float off to this top box here. Float to the left. So that means any content afterwards will reflow like water and fill in the space to the right. Now it's kind of strange. For example, if we take a look at to explain float, uh, we'll take a look at this. Um, you see how we have an image inside. Uh, we have an image inside this paragraph right here, right? See that sits to inside that image is actually inline. It's an inline element. It just sits on the baseline like a word in, in, a, in a paragraph. So that image, let's try it and, and change the float on that thing. So just before that we'll say, go here we'll say paragraph image img and I'll say float left. I'll come back to the main section. I'll show you why this float stuff works. So let's float any image elements inside a paragraph to the left. Now this floats hard left and all the content reflows itself up to the right instead of it sitting on the baseline of the text. Now I can change that and I can say, well, okay, no, I'd rather have it float to the right. So watch the image as I reflow the page. Now it moves over to the right, and all the rest of the content reflows up and fills the space now left on the left of the element. Left, right, floats. Very weird. Yes, they're kind of weird. Sort of. I'll use float now. <clears throat> Instead of a box or an image inside a paragraph, I'll float these three boxes to the left. So if I float all of them left, if this one's float left, the next one will reflow and fill in this space on the right. And if that one is also float left, the following box will reflow and fill in any space available on the right. Imagine throwing those three blocks in a, in a bucket of water, right? They can float and bump around and let's try it. So let's go ahead down and say to the main section elements, float 
left. And there we go. This one floats left. The next one goes kaboom, flows up here. The next one, this is float left, so subsequent content flows up here. And even the footer is like, well, there's still space around here. This is floated left, so I'm going to reflow up here and kind of down here. Crazy. <clears throat> yep. I can reflow, I can float all these to the right if I want, instead of left, just like I did the image. If this is a bit abstract, well, it kind of should be. It's a bit weird. If I float them right, this one floats to the right. This one reflows to, the, to uh, the left. This is float right, so it's over hard against this. The subsequent one goes up to the left. And the footer's like, oh, there's still space around on the left here because everything's floated right, so I'll just slide on up in here and fill in that space. Float. Now, if I don't want stuff after these, to, I don't want them to fill in that space. I want them to clear, uh, wait till we're clear of sections down here. I can clear a float. And how I clear a float is I say, okay, this footer down here, right? I don't want this to start until we're clear of these crazy floated sections. So let's go here and say footer clear right because everything's floated right so this means don't start the footer until we're clear on the right of crazy floated stuff floats and clears and then the footer won't stop until the far right margin here is clear. Then it starts down here. So if you're going to float something, make sure anything after that you want to start on a new line, you clear it. Weird? Yeah, I know. So if this is, but this might be float left. If this is float left and this is clear right, you can imagine you're not going to get what you want. Nope. Now it's up here. So this is float left, these, bo these purple boxes. This is looking for clear on the right. Well, it's clear on the right of floated stuff because everything's floated left. So up it flows, just like water, right? So what you can do is you can hedge your bet, and you can just say, nah, I don't know what crazy stuff might be floating around up there. Just wait till we're clear of both margins of floated stuff anywhere, and then we're, should, we should be good. I wouldn't blame you for doing that. Okay. Box model. Crazy stuff. All right. Um, so I didn't quite get to. Next week, we'll have to cover a little bit of positioning, um, which is important. So I won't quite get to that. That's OK. Um, I won't get it today. So for the rest of, so what I want you to do for today, your homework. Where, ah, where's my blackboard? Did I blow it away again? Oh, there it is. All right. Um, so finish. So lab 10 is your take home. <coughs> Using the HTML document provided to you, complete as many of the CSS challenges as you can and submit the resulting CSS, HTML, and images in a zip archive to the appropriate exercise on Blackboard. Okay? So the instructions are all actually embedded. If you download the in-class exercise 10, You've got the week to do it. Okay. I'm I'm going to be pretty flexible on labs, right? Because uh, you guys are trying to crunch a lot of stuff into a shorter period of time. So, but I would I would get to it while your mind is is more fresh, right? So try and get that. If you can, carve out a little bit of time tonight. Uh, finish, read up on chapter 11, lay out with styles, mark reviewed. Do your quick quiz. It's only a, it's only I think uh, 15 questions, 10 to 15 questions. And that's that. We'll see you next week.
and i will say